Welcome to Aquinas on Christ, a Zoom conference held in July 2020. I would like to introduce Father John Emery, a Dominican priest who is head and professor of the dogmatic theology at the University of St. Thomas Aquinas, UNSTA, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has a doctorate from the University of Freiburg with a focus on Christology and is also co-founder and co-director of the Aquinas Project, which runs the iAquinas website. The Aquinas Project has the goal of offering a formation in the thought of Aquinas to anyone around the world free of charge. It has an array of videos and articles in various languages. So join me please in giving a warm welcome to Father John Emery. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Um, so we're going to look at Christ's passion. I am not going to read as Sister Magdalene did and uh, Father Simon did. I'm going to follow the uh, texts we have. We're going to read them and comment on them. Um, we have five uh, parts to this. First is an introduction. So we're look, going to look at the passion from the lens, from the perspective, perspective of charity. Second, what is charity for Aquinas? That, this is very important. Um, and this is often overlooked because for Aquinas, theology is one. And so dogmatics and moral theology go together. And so um, that is a, a common mistake. So we have dogmaticians who don't look at the moral side of theology and moral theologians who don't look at dogmatics. Um, it's very important to bring both of those together as Aquinas did. Then, then we'll look at uh, Christ's charity, the fact that he had charity like our own, and uh, next, the fact that Christ had the fullness of grace and therefore uh, very great or maximal charity. And why this is important, not only the fact that he has the greatest one, also it has a, a, a role in our salvation. And then lastly, we'll look at the passion from this per perspective of charity. So uh, the first three texts you have on your handout refer to um, the first two refer to the passion and charity. So I'll read, I'd love for others to read as well so we don't get bored with my own uh, voice, but I'll, I'll read the first ones anyway. Christ's passion is the proper cause of the forgiveness of sins in three ways. First of all, by way of exciting our charity, because as the apostle says, God commendeth his charity towards us, because when as yet we were sinners, according to the time Christ, died for us. But it is by charity that we procure pardon of our sins, according to Luke. Many sins are forgiven her because she hath loved much. So we see that charity is um, the purpose of uh, the passion is to excite our charity, and the passion is worked by Christ um, because of his charity and uh, through his charity. So we find charity in Christ, in the passion, and the effect, what he's going to produce, what he wants to give us through his passion, and his charity in his passion is charity as well. We'll come back to this text. Second, we have, a, um, this is a very important passage in, in Aquinas' works at the end of this question 48 of the Persia Pars. He gives us a um, shorthand or a, a, sorry, a, a, like a summary of the different ways in which the passion saves us. And uh, so uh, Christ's passion, according as it is compared with his Godhead, uh, his divinity, uh, and as much as he is God, operates in an efficient manner. 
So God works as an is efficacious. He is a cause of our salvation, but he does it um, with Christ's humanity and through Christ's humanity. And Christ's humanity is truly efficient, truly works our salvation. And we see this also in that Christ's humanity truly uh, causes grace in us, uh, communicates grace to us. And this is something uh, original in Aquinas, that uh, Christ's humanity be associated with God's own causing of grace and salvation in us um, as an instrument. We'll come back to this. Then there is, insofar as it is compared with the will of Christ, and so all the other causalities that are mentioned here, all the other ways in which Christ saves us, involve the will. And of course, the will is where we find charity. So charity, we will see in the next uh, section of the handout, uh, affects the will. And so look at all the causalities, all the saving, all the ways in which Christ saves us that, are, uh, depend, that depend on the will and charity, therefore. Insofar as it is compared with the will of Christ's soul, it acts in a meritorious manner. So he merits our salvation. Considered as being with, within Christ's very flesh, it acts by way of satisfaction or atonement. So he atones for us through his will and therefore his charity. Inasmuch as we are liberated by it from the debt of punishment, um, this is, sorry, this is satisfaction or atonement, uh, it concerns the debt of punishment, while inasmuch as we are freed from the servitude of guilt, it acts by way of redemption. So we are redeemed, uh, we are liberated from, the, from guilt, uh, the most important part of sin, through this will of Christ in his passion, therefore his charity. And lastly, but insofar as we are reconciled with God, it acts by way of sacrifice, as shall be shown further on. So Christ's will and his charity is involved in his sacrifice. And we always say the sacrifice of the mass. And this is, of course, the sacrifice uh, he worked through his passion. And it is charity that works that sacrifice principally. So the last, um, so number three on, on your handout uh, refers to that instrument I mentioned briefly. The humanity of Christ is the instrument of the Godhead, of his own divinity or of the Trinity, not indeed an inanimate instrument, because there are animate instruments and inanimate instruments. This is a distinction that is um, employed by Aristotle. There are inanimate instruments, but Christ's humanity is an animate instrument, which nowise acts, that's the inanimate instrument in nowise acts, but is merely acted upon like a pen um, or a computer or a saw or an ax. But an instrument animated by a rational soul which is so acted upon as to act. So he is certainly acted upon as an instrument, and that's why he is an instrument. But because he is an animate instrument, he also acts. Um, and hence the nature of the action demanded that he should have habitual grace. So this is a very important uh, question in the Tertia Pars. We, uh, Sister Margaret referred to it, Sister Magdalene, sorry, referred to it uh, in passing, and Father Simon um, dealt with the questions that come after this one, but this is tied to that of um, the knowledge of Christ. So it's the question on the grace of Christ, whether Christ had grace or not, and what his grace was like and everything. And so the first article of that question asks whether Christ needed grace, and the answer is, Yes, he needed grace. Um, and one of the reasons given is this one, that he had to act as an animate instrument. And so his humanity had, had to be prepared, um, had to be capable of cooperating as an instrument 
with God, with his own Godhead, um, his divinity. Okay, so this is an introduction. So there is charity in Christ, there is grace in Christ, there's charity in Christ, and it is definitely involved in the passion, and not in just one way, but in many ways. Um, if anyone has a comment or a question, they can type it in the chat and maybe I can um, put it, insert it in, in, in my own explanation while I, while I'm explaining this. So we'll go to point number two. What is charity? So many things can be said about charity. Aquinas deals with, with charity uh, in extenso. He says a lot of things on charity. So I'm only going to focus on three aspects. The first aspect is, um, is found in Aquinas's treatment of the Trinity. So at the end of his uh, treaty or treatment of the Trinity, he refers to the missions. So the two preceding persons, the Son or the Word, and the Holy Spirit are sent. Uh, they are sent to the souls of the faithful, to the souls and also angels who have sanctifying grace. Or rather, the missions uh, give us grace or we receive, the, these two things are simultaneous, grace and the missions, they go together. Um, now, each one of the preceding persons, the Son is sent, the Holy Spirit is sent, the Father is not sent. It is never said in the Bible that the Father is sent. It is said that the Son is sent and that the Holy Spirit is sent. It is never said the, that the Son is sent by the Holy Spirit, but it is said that the Father sends the Holy Spirit and that the Son sends the Holy Spirit. Um, so these missions follow the eternal processions, and when they are sent to us, they produce something in us. They affect a change in us. That's how we know they are in us, because they don't change. The Son and the Holy Spirit don't change when they come to us. And actually, they were already in us before they came as missions. What happens is um, they are now in us, uh, within us, in a new way. So now they'd be in us in two ways because the divine persons are present in everything as Sister Magdalene mentioned. She mentioned the three modes of divine presence. So mode number one is the one that follows uh, the act of being, everything that is created, everything that exists um, has this first mode of divine presence. God is present in everything because he has created it, he knows it, and he works in it uh, and through it and with it. Um, but the second mode of divine presence is the one that um, corresponds to the missions, the divine mission. So the Son is sent and the Holy Spirit is sent, and we know they are sent because they do something in us. What do they do? Well, um, the Son, the Word, in the Trinity is the fruit of God's knowledge, we could say. And the Holy Spirit is the fruit of God's love. Um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to say much else on the Trinity because um, of our time constraints and we want to focus on the passion and charity in the passion. But uh, the Holy Spirit um, produces in us something that is like itself or like himself, something that is similar to himself. And this is love. So we know that the Holy Spirit is in us when his love is in us. He puts this love in our will, just as the Son or the Word puts in our uh, intelligence, he puts um, a wisdom faith in this life, the vision of the divine essence or the beatific vision in our intelligence in, in heaven or in the case of Christ already in this life. Um, 
Anyway, so this is the first thing that is said about charity in the Summa Theologiae. Charity is found in Aquinas' treatment of uh, the Trinity. And so the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit, and Romans 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 5 says that exactly, this is exactly what it says, um, that the Holy Spirit is given to us, is uh, poured out on us, that we receive the infusion of the Holy Spirit with charity that is also infused in our will or in our heart. Um, so that's, that's the text you have there. I'm not going to read it, but it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful passage. So this is the first thing we can say about charity. Charity is a likeness of the Holy Spirit in our heart, in our will, and it is a likeness of the Holy Spirit that makes us like the Holy Spirit, transforms us in the image, say, our will is transformed and made like the Holy Spirit, just as our intelligence, our intellect is made, is transformed and made like the word, the eternal word. Second aspect of uh, charity I would like to refer to is that charity is friendship. For Aquinas, charity is friendship. Now, for many of you, this might be perhaps obvious. You might be used to uh, referring to charity as friendship, or perhaps not. Uh, but the fact is, Aquinas was the first one to define charity as friendship. And this was the 13th century. So Aquinas is very original. Um, unfortunately, this uh, is still quite original, at least in, in moral theology, I find, and in, and in theology. Um, I hope it's not the case in, in sermons or in retreats, but it's very important to, um, I think it's very important to understand what Aquinas means by this friendship. You know, one of the objections, and there was an Englishman, uh, Blessed Elred, I think it is, uh, who was a Cistercian, he said, we can't uh, really consider charity to be friendship because we have to love our enemies. So we're going to say it's friendship is involved, but charity is, is more, it's, it's not quite friendship. Um, but Aquinas says that's not the case. Charity is friendship. And in order to define charity as friendship, he uh, employs Aristotle's definition. He uses Aristotle a lot, but that does not mean that he reduces faith to, to reason. He uses uh, Aristotle and, and other thinkers um, to help explain, ex help um, especially explain uh, what we believe and to connect the different things we believe, to connect the mysteries. Um, and so Aristotle's definition of friendship uh, included many elements, but the main element Aquinas discovered um, is koinonia in Greek. Koinonia, maybe you've heard of the word. There was a time when, it, when everyone spoke of koinonia or koinoneo, that's the verb, or koinono. Uh, but in Latin, that was translated communicatio or communicare, which we could translate as communication in uh, English, although it doesn't, it's not just speaking or, or transmitting ideas, it's, it's the giving of, and more than just the giving. And that's, that's why I've uh, included uh, the text number six on the handout. And if we pay attention, there are two meanings of communicatio, communication, and to communicate in that uh, text. And there's a third meaning in text number seven. So I'll read number six. Since there is a communication between man and God, inasmuch as he communicates his happiness to us, some kind of friendship must needs be based on this same communication. Of, of which it is written, 
in the first letter to Corinthians, God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son. The love which is based on this communication is charity. Wherefore, it is evident that charity is the friendship of man for God or towards God would be a bit more literal. Um, so communication here means at least two things. First one is that God gives us something. He communicates something to us. What does he communicate to us? His um, happiness or beatitude. So friendship is this friendship that is founded on this giving, this communication, which is beatitude, which is uh, this happiness that is God's. That is the first meaning of communication. So it's God, what God's gift, what God gives us. The second meaning is that we have something in common with God. Because uh, in order to um, be friends with someone, we need to have something in common with them. And uh, likeness is a cause of love. Um, Aquinas has a beautiful, art, beautiful article on this, uh, the Prima Secunde 27.3. Someone's interested. Anyway, so God gives us something, and because of that, we have something in common with God, and we can be friends with God because we have something in common with Him. And we don't just have a being in common with God, just the act of being or our nature, the fact that we can uh, think or love naturally. We have this um, supernatural, this supernatural gift, this grace. And Aquinas chooses not to call it grace. He chooses to call it beatitude. Uh, and this, we, we, can, uh, ref, we can also uh, link this to what Father Simon was speaking to us about just a few, uh, well, an hour ago. Um, the third meaning of communication, so we have God gives us something, his gift. We have something in common with him. So communicatio is to have something in common with someone. And the third meaning is found in Aquinas' response to the first objection, which I am not going to read here, but it refers to how can, how can we be friends with God if um, we don't live with him? We can't see him. We, we can't have a, a beer with him or discuss something with him or watch a movie with him. Uh, and so, of course, Aquinas is going to say, man's life is twofold. So it's not just what we see. There is his outward life in respect of his sensitive and corporeal nature. And with regard to this life, there is no communication or fellowship between us and God or the angels. So we don't have this outward life. Uh, we don't share this outward life. We don't have this outward life in common with God. But the other is man's spiritual life in respect of his mind. Uh, and mind is not just uh, intelligence, it's the heart, uh, it's in, in intelligence and will. And with regard to this life, there is fellowship between us and both God and the angels. Now, in this life, that is imperfect or in an inquit manner, it's uh, a seed. Of, but it's it's a reality, but it's a seed of what it will be in, in this present state of life. Wherefore it is written, our conversation is in heaven. And their conversation means a living together, living with someone else. That's a, yeah, that's a, a very literal or, or a sterile trans, translation of the word conversare, the Latin term. But this conversation, will be perfected in heaven. So in heaven, we will have consummate uh, living in common with God. So these are the three meanings of communicare, communicatio, communication, uh, in Aquinas' definition of charity as friendship. And uh, we will see that this plays a role in our understanding of the passion. Okay, so third aspect of charity I'd like to refer to is that charity is the root of merit. Merit is um, merit is not as 
So Father Simon referred to the beatific vision, Christ's beatific vision during his uh, earthly existence, uh, during the life he spent here among us as not being uh, that fashionable. Well, merit is definitely not fashionable uh, today. It hasn't been for a while. Uh, I mean, who wants to say that we deserve heaven? I mean, that just sounds awful. Um, but the fact is, scripture uh, refers to merit a lot. Um, and, um, and this is, in fact, a, a teaching that is, um, the church continues to, to defend and, and to teach. Um, so, but in order to understand merit correctly, uh, we need to transform our understanding of merit. There are certain aspects of merit in this life that um, apply to this supernatural merit, but some aspects don't. So in this life, if something is merited, it is not gratuitous. It is not free. I mean, I deserve this. You know, when someone says, oh, I'll give you this. No, no, wait a minute. I did all of this. You know, I worked, so now I deserve this salary or whatever. Uh, you're not giving me anything uh, for free here because I've done my uh, I've done my my share here. Uh, well, this this uh, distinction this up the distinction is okay, but the opposition between the two does not apply in supernatural merit. So, in fact, I'll say it quickly, and we'll go into it a little bit more. But we won't be able to. I mean, this is not this talk is not on merit, unfortunately. Um, so, in fact, grace allows us to merit. And so merit is actually like a second stage of grace, where there's more grace involved. So God can give us something uh, gratuitously, freely, and we don't do anything. And he does that. For example, when we are saved, when we receive grace the first time. But his grace is so powerful and so gratuitous that it incorporates us into its own gratuity into its its own gift we are made a gift as well so we are able to cooperate to collaborate with this gift uh, and and this doesn't make the result or the effect of our collaboration is not less gratuitous it is more gratuitous because God gives us the grace to be able to collaborate with him. And so what he gives us is merited by us, but it is also uh, a grace. Um, this is a, a, a revolution in the mind. This is something we, we need to, to, to uh, change the way we, we, we look at things in order to understand uh, the merit this supernatural merit, the merit that uh, is a part of the life of grace in us. So I, I gave you two um, texts there. Number eight refers to charity as being uh, the cause of merit. And then uh, number nine is actually a passage taken from the question on merit in the Prima Secunde. And there it refers to the main element of merit. So the, and this is something Aquinas also discovers. This is another originality of Aquinas. And uh, Aquinas himself evolved. Uh, so when he was younger, he was an excellent theologian at, at a very, very young age, but he discovered this later on in life. And this is the fact that there is a pre-ordering or a pre-ordination. God knows what he wants to give us. And so our merit fulfills something that God has uh, already planned or, or dispensed, ordered, give us. So our merit doesn't change God, doesn't uh, force God. It fulfills um, what God has chosen to, to give us, to work in us and uh, with us. So uh, that's all I'm going to say on charity. Now let's look at Christ's charity. 
Um, does Christ have charity? Well, he does. Um, and this is obvious, but I did, I did uh, provide some texts there for you to read uh, later on. You can, uh, you can continue to, to, um, to think about this topic and, and deepen your knowledge of it. Um, so these texts refer to uh, Christ's charity. I'd like to read number 12 on, the hand, on your handout. It's a translation of Aquinas' commentary on John. That's um, chapter 13, verse 34. And so Christ is um, telling his disciples that they should love one another as he has loved us or loved them. And so Aquinas says, Christ loved us in a threefold manner, gratuitously, efficaciously, and virtuously. Virtuously indeed, because given that every friendship is founded upon some communication, in fact, likeness is the cause of love, the virtuous friendship is such that it exists on account of a likeness or a communication according to a good. Now Christ loved us insofar as we are like him through the grace of adoption, loving us according to this likeness so as to draw us to God. And so Jeremiah says, with an everlasting charity have I loved you, therefore having mercy upon you, I have drawn you toward me. So we see Aquinas refers the definition of charity as friendship to Christ himself. And so there's this likeness uh, that Christ receives as man that we also receive. And so there's going to be a connection between his charity and our own. And the next uh, passage, the, that's number 13. The handout refers to Christ's merit. Did Christ merit? And so one of the objections is, how can Christ merit for others if he does not merit for himself? Now, Father Simon just said, I think quite convincingly, um, that Christ had the beatific vision during his life. So what did he have to merit if he already had what we are trying to merit? So Aquinas says that's true. He did have the beatific vision, but there was a special dispensation. Um, there were many special uh, dispensations, things that God did and he continues to do, but in Christ's life anyway. Um, and according to the special dispensation, the beatific vision or the vision of the divine essence in Christ's soul, and Aquinas says, in the highest part of his soul or the deepest part of his soul, I would say. So what occurs there because of this special dispensation does not flow out, does not affect the rest of his soul and his body. So this flowing out of um, this effect of beatitude, which is fine in the highest part of the soul or the mind or the heart, um, that is what Christ needed to merit. So he didn't have something in order to be able to merit. Of course, he had charity, so he, had, he could merit. And then the most important element of merit, I just mentioned this preordination or this preordering to merit something. No one can merit anything if he is not preordered by God to merit it. And so Christ was preordered to merit his own, um, not his own beatific vision, because he had that already, but the overflowing of his, uh, of his beatitude to the rest of his soul and his body. And, uh, and some other things like the glory we tribute him, his ascension, and some of those other things. Um, so he merits his resurrection, for example, and scripture does refer to that very explicitly. Okay, so number four, Christ's charity is maximal. He not only has charity, as we do, 
it's not only very great, it's the maximum charity. It's the maximum one can have of charity. And this is important because Christ is our head. Um, before I refer to this headship of Christ, text number 14 refers to the divine missions in Christ. So Christ is a visible mission of the Son. The Son becomes man, um, as Sister Magdalene uh, explained to us. Um, and when he uh, becomes man, the very first moment of his uh, incarnation, he receives the invisible mission of, um, of the sent persons, of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so in his heart, in his mind, he sees the Father and he, and he loves, he has charity from the very first moment. And uh, Father Simon told us about how this could be possible or was possible, how we could understand that it was, um, that it happened, comparing this to what you know, people who have uh, passed away who no longer have a brain, for example. Um, but this knowledge of God was followed by an act of love uh, in Christ. And these were human acts, a human act of knowledge and a human act of love, of charity. Uh, and this was a full, the highest, fullest, maximal mission ever um, sent to a creature. Christ is not a creature, but his humanity is created. So his humanity received the fullness of the invisible mission or second mode of divine presence. Um, and then in the text number 15, uh, that's a, a long test text. Um, Aquinas refers to three reasons why a, uh, Christ had the fullness of uh, grace. And one of them is because of his proximity or nearness to the source of grace. Um, and second is because of all the effects of grace. He had all the effects of grace. And a uh, third reason is because he, he was called, he was sent to be the cause of grace in others. And the cause has to have what it is going to cause in others. You cannot give what you do not have. Aquinas refers to this principle uh, many times. And the cause, the universal cause of grace has to have the ma maximal grace and therefore charity. Text number 16 refers to um, Christ as head. And Christ is head because of three things. Um, these are excerpts. So if you want to uh, understand this more fully, you should read the whole article or at least the whole corpus or the whole response, uh, the body of the, of the article. Uh, but the three reasons why Christ is considered a head, and this of course is uh, a teaching by St. Paul, is that he is the first among um, in this body. He is the first of those who are saved. He himself is not saved, but he is the first of those who have grace, who have the second mode of divine presence. He is the first of those who has charity. Um, and then there's the fact that he has the fullness of this grace, of this uh, second mode of divine presence, the fullness of charity. And the third reason is that he is a cause. So he is the first, he is the maximal, um, and he is a, a cause. And that's why he's a head. And if you want to understand why a head is first, maximal, and cause in a body, you can read the rest of that article, which I have not uh, included in, in the handout. Okay, so now we come to uh, Christ's passion. So all of that was an introduction, a very long introduction, but hopefully it will, we will reap the fruits now. Um, so what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to consider I'm going to consider Christ's um, saving passion um, according to different ways in which Christ saves us. And I'll say something about charity. Uh, we could say different ways in which Christ's charity saves us. So the first way is, and that's text number one again. Um, the first way is that Christ is an exemplar. He is an exemplary cause. So he's a model, but not just what we are going to imitate. But because grace is something that God works in us, and even charity, yes, an act of charity is ours, but it's not just ours. It's also the Holy Spirit's. And it's more the Holy Spirit's than, ours, than our own. So um, all of this is worked in us by God. And God does, it, does that. He works in us uh, according to an exemplar, or according to a model. And that model or exemplar is Christ. Christ's charity. Which charity? Well, the charity he had during uh, all of his life but especially the charity during his passion. So Christ's charity is a model of our own charity. And he, this is a way in which he saves us. What God will do in us, the charity that he will infuse, that he will uh, give us, is modeled after Christ's charity. We could say our charity is a Christic charity. And... Uh, passionate charity in a, in a different sense than uh, what we usually say. is it's, it's marked by Christ's passion. The second way in which, uh, well, there's a, another um, text, text number 17 on your handout. Uh, again, it's a translation of, a, of Aquinas' commentary on John chapter 13, it's a different verse, the next verse, but refers to Christ's charity and to charity as a badge of Christ. So the analogy here, he compares this to soldiers who wear a badge, and that badge says, or, or insignia, that uh, referred to their allegiance. Um, and so he says that Christ too has an army, has soldiers, and the badge we wear is his is charity. So um, what distinguishes us from other soldiers is charity, because that is Christ. Okay, so this on, the, on Christ's uh, charity as being an exemplar of our own. Next, we have Christ's humanity as an instrument, an instrument of grace. So I'm not going to refer... Uh, to this, which is, we could have a whole day or a whole talk on just Christ, humanity being an instrument of our, of our salvation and of grace. I'm going to refer to charity and Christ's instrumentality or uh, Christ's humanity being an instrument. We just said that Christ's humanity is an animate instrument, not an inanimate instrument. In order to be an animate instrument, he needs to have charity. Why? Because if we use an instrument like a pen, when, we, uh, when, I, when I write, the pen um, does something too. I mean, it doesn't do it freely. Not this one anyway. Um, the pen does something I can't do. So this isn't the case with God. God can do everything without us and without instruments, but he chooses to use an instrument. In my case, I choose to use it because I need it. So the pen is going to leave a mark on the paper. Uh, it's going to stain the paper, but I am going to guide the pen. And so the result is going, to, is going to be mine and the pens. So who wrote this? I did, but you know, the pen could say, I, I, also, I wrote it too. Anyway, in the case of... Um, Christ, Christ's humanity, this would be Christ's humanity and this would be God. Uh, Christ's humanity uh, follows God's movement 
but does that freely. Uh, Christ will also stain the paper, <laughs> in a sense. His humanity will do something um, because God wants this. God wants our salvation to be marked or stained. I mean, the word is not very beautiful, but anyway, marked by uh, Christ's humanity and what he did as man and what he did um, through charity. Now, in order for him to truly collaborate with the movement of the hand, the pen would have to be able to freely accept this. And that cannot be done without charity. So um, the last text, number 21, in that section, the handout, uh, refers to this. Without charity, we would be inanimate instruments. We would not, if we did not receive something in our soul, in our will, we would not be able to collaborate with the Holy Spirit when we love, when we uh, perform an act of charity, we would not be able to call that act of charity our own, and we would not truly collaborate with the Holy Spirit. We would be moved uh, as inanimate instruments. In order for us to be animate instruments and truly collaborate with the Holy Spirit, we need charity. So this is uh, a very important aspect here because Christ's humanity, again, this is Aquinas who discovers this uh, or who explains this very clearly for the first time in the history of theology. Um, Christ's humanity is capable of transmitting grace. Christ can communicate grace as man. He does this as God, obviously, but he can, his humanity does that. And this is very important because the extensions of his humanity, um, the instruments his humanity moves, which we call the sacraments, also communicate grace. This is a Catholic teaching, a very important tenet of our, of our faith, that sacraments communicate grace truly. Uh, but they do, they do so because Christ moves them. The uh, all of these other instruments only move because Christ is moving them, and they are always moved by Christ, Christ and His charity. So every sacrament we receive is is moved by Christ's humanity, which is moved by His charity. Um, we're running short on time, so I'm going to cut this explanation short. Let's go to Christ's merit. So Christ can merit for himself, he can also merit for others. Why is that? Because he is pre-ordered by God. God, there's an ordering, a pre-ordering of um, Christ's charity and grace. He received this preordination to merit for others. And this is uh, tied to the fact that he is our head. And this is, in fact, when Aquinas explains that Christ is our head, uh, or when he is explaining how he saves us and he refers to Christ as head, he, he mentions this, because he is called to merit for others. And how does he merit for others? Well, he does this as head. And so let's, let's read, um, which passage are we going to read? Uh, number 23. As stated above, grace was in Christ not merely as an individual, but also as the head of the whole church, to whom all are united as members to a head, who constitute one mystical person. And hence, it is that Christ's merit extends to others inasmuch as they are his members, even as in a man the action of the head reaches in a manner to all his members, since it perceives not merely for itself alone, but for all the members. 
uh, and he he says this in, in different ways. Here he refers to the head and other members. Uh, another another place he refers to his hand. So in text number 28, which we're not going to re read right now, he refers to his hand and his foot. Um, anyway, when Christ merits for us, uh, he merits for us as being one with him. So because he is our head, he is actually meriting for himself and for us, but not for us as being distinct from him. He's meriting for us in as much as we are one with him. And we are one with him in this mystical person or mystical body. Uh, so to, to recap what I just said about Christ's merit, Christ merits for his own um, soul and body, not for the highest part of his soul, but for the part of his soul that is that has a, a connection or is related to his body. Uh, for a lot of people, that is most of the soul. That's what they're most acquainted with, and that's feelings and imagination and and uh, and all the, the things we feel uh, bodily and uh, our, our, uh, our knowledge through the senses and uh, all of that. All of that is going to receive an overflow of beatitude. And that's something Christ is going to merit. At the same time, the same act of merit, his charity is going to merit that and is also going to merit that overflow to his mystical body, to all of us. So he merits that twofold overflow of beatitude from uh, the deepest part of his soul, from his will and his intelligence, to the rest of his humanity, and to all of us as members of his body, the body of which he is the head. Um, why? Because he alone has been preordered to merit for us. So can we merit for others like Christ does? No, we cannot. Not like Christ does. We can merit for others in a different way. We're not going to go into that. But just to be clear, it's different from what uh, occurs in the case of Christ. Because God has disposed this, has uh, preordered this. He has sent Christ to merit for us. Um, so you can this comparison between Christ and uh, between Christ's merit and our merit is found in uh, in the text in text number twenty two on your hand up. Um, Actually, the text is much longer, and if you want to see how he compares our merit to Christ, you should read the whole uh, article or, or corpus. But if we want to be a little bit more technical, we can say, no one can merit condignly for another his first grace, save Christ alone. So there's a certain equality in that type of merit. Uh, these are technical expressions. So not all of you perhaps are acquainted with them, but um, what it means is that merit establishes a certain equality. A again, we, we hear equality and we're going to merit something from God on equal terms. This just sounds, doesn't sound right, but uh, this, this is based on grace. So it is a gift that we can uh, merit something on these terms, that there is certain equality between what we do and what God gives us. Let us think about it in this way. Charity is a gift from God. It's not a little gift. Charity is immense. It's worth more. Charity, one act of charity is worth more than the whole universe without grace. So there is already a certain equality between that gift of God and 
beatitude. And in fact, Aquinas defines charity as a friendship founded upon the communication of beatitude. So there is already a certain equality there. Now, with God orders us, uh, he, he dis dis disposes this in, according to his plan, that what we do with this charity, we are able to collaborate, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit because we have this charity. What we do will be ours and the Holy Spirit's, 100% his and 100% ours, uh, though, of course, <laughs> we would not be able to do it without him. Uh, and that is an understatement. So Christ receives that charity, not only to merit for himself, but to merit for others. Now, this is uh, who are those others? All those who are united to him. So whoever is incorporated into Christ's mystical person or mystical body receive these merits. And that's what he does during his passion. Now, Christ merited from the very first moment of his human existence. So when he was a baby in Mary's womb, uh, Father Simon referred to that moment. I think it was a question that prompted that uh, response. But uh, from that very first moment, he merits. And so he merits throughout his life. When he's... Um, Speaking, he's preaching, he's, he's um, hungry, he's crying, he's performing miracles, whatever. He's always meriting because he always has charity. But during his passion, there is a special merit. Why? Because God, again, God preordered those merits to something special. What is that? To remove obstacles. We, not, we need God to give us grace, because without grace, we cannot collaborate with God. We cannot see God face to face in heaven and so many other things. But we also need God to remove the obstacles, the obstacles we have created to receive this grace. We cannot become friends of God if we continue to be his enemies and be marked by uh, the, the, the vices and, and uh, and different structures uh, that we have created in our being that are an obstacle to this charity, this grace, this friendship with God. So Christ's merit during his passion removed those obstacles. How? In three ways. And that's, that's the last section of the handout. Satisfaction, sacrifice, and redemption. Satisfaction or atonement, that's the first text we have there. That's Article 2. This is all very, um, Aquinas is, is a master of, of uh, connecting things and, and, and especially ordering things. So always pay attention to what Aquinas says first and what he says second. I mean, Sometimes he'll use another, a different order. For example, in different works, he might use a different order, but there's always a reason for the order he provides. Um, he wrote a lot, uh, but he was very quick in the mind, and so he was able to uh, always provide uh, an adequate order of things. And so Article 1 refers to merit, and Article 2 refers to Satisfaction and Article 3 refers to sacrifice, and Article 4 refers to redemption. Why? Because all of these, so satisfaction, sacrifice, and redemption are based on merit. It's actually, it's actually merit doing something. I haven't given you there Article 4. I, I jump to the next question where he also refers to redemption in, with a, a text that I find is, is, uh, is more uh, uh, adequate for our purpose here. So, first text is number 26 on your handout, Article 2. I answer that he properly atones, satisfacit in uh, Latin, uh, for an offense uh, who offers something which the offended one 
loves equally or even more than he detested the offense. But by suffering out of love and obedience, Christ gave more to God than was required to compensate for the offense of the whole human race. First of all, because of the exceeding charity from which he suffered. So then he, he gives two other reasons, but because we are focusing on Christ's charity, the main reason Christ atones for um, the debt we incur because of sin, and go back to page number one on the handout to that, uh, to, the, to text number two. So, it acts by way of satisfaction in as much as we are liberated by it from the debt of punishment. So there's a, a debt of punishment due to sin. And we are liberated from that because of Christ's charity uh, during his passion. So the merits that result from Christ's charity during his passion atone for us. Um, for the debt of punishment um, that we that we incur that we that is due to us um, now something that's very interesting is that Aquinas uh, refers to a, a a passage in in the first letter of John and um, there John says that Christ saves us. He, he shed his blood for us and, and uh, he saves us and he saves the whole world, he says. So what he did is enough to save everyone. But John says the whole world. And Aquinas, <laughs> uh, many times, uh, at least four, five times, he adds adds something to that he always adds a little something he says sometimes he says and for many worlds if they existed other times he says for uh a hundred thousand worlds if they existed and once he says for infinite worlds if they existed so christ's charity merits something so great that it can atone for all the debt of punishment that we have, and it would be enough for infinite worlds. Uh, how can we explain that? And so this Aquinas doesn't say this explicitly, but I'll just go off here for, for I'll stray off the path for just uh, 10 seconds. Uh, because Christ had to merit the overflow of his maximal, the attitude to his soul and body, to the lower part of his soul and body, that merit is very, very great. And so that, by meriting that, it includes infinite worlds. Of course, here, uh, it's more a question of quality than quantity. So it's... Um, the quality of that merit is so high, so great, that it uh, includes everything we could, we could possibly do that is wrong, the punishment that would be due to that. Okay. Uh, next, we have sacrifice. Aquinas, when he, when he um, deals with Christ's sacrifice and uh, the person who offers a sacrifice is called a priest. Um, Sacerdos in Latin. So in both those places, when he, if, if we want to understand how Christ offers his sacrifice, we also have to read on Christ as priest. Well, in both those places, Aquinas, sorry, Aquinas draws on St. Augustine a lot. He really follows Augustine a lot on, on this. And he just, uh, quotes uh, Augustine, uh, you know, extensively. Anyway, here's a, a quotation, a, a quotation taken from Augustine, The City of God. 
A true sacrifice is every good work done in order that we may cling to God in holy fellowship. Yet referred to that consummation of happiness wherein we can be truly blessed. Okay, so first thing I, I, want, I, want, to, um, I want to focus on is Look at the way Augustine defines sacrifice. We find fellowship and we find consummation of happiness and truly blessed. So sacrifice is tied for Augustine and Aquinas chooses that text. Uh, it's tied to the attitude and friendship. And that's why he's going to say, I continue now, I'm going to read the rest, but as is added in the same place by Augustine, Christ offered himself up for us in the passion. And this voluntary enduring of the passion was most acceptable to God as coming from charity. So the sacrifice was worth something because there was charity. If there had not been charity, that sacrifice would not have been worth anything. And uh, this is taught very clearly in the Old Testament and in the New. And if anyone went to uh, or read uh, the gospel that we read uh, in yesterday's mass, sacrifice and mercy or love, um, you know, Christ, gives us the um, true interpretation of how those two are related to each other. So Christ's sacrifice um, truly reconciles us, and that's what a sacrifice does. It does away with enmity with God and brings friendship with God. It reconciles us to God. Okay, and the third of these uh, is redemption and that's the last text on your handout i'll read christ's passion causes forgiveness of sins by way of redemption for since he is our head then by the passion which he endured from love and obedience he delivered us as his members from our sins and by the price of his passion in the same way as if a man by the good industry of his hands were to redeem himself from a sin committed with his feet for just as the natural body is one, though made up of diverse members, so the whole church, Christ's mystic body, is reckoned as one person with its head, who is or which is Christ. So again, redemption uh, saves us from that other aspect of sin, the most important aspect of sin, which is guilt. We are redeemed, we are liberated, we are made free from sin by christ's passion and the first reason for that is because of his charity and his merits uh, he merits because of his charity he merits uh, something he, what he merits um frees us liberates us his merits are liberating um, so his charity attains for us true freedom. So it's not only the Holy Spirit that makes us free, as St. Paul teaches, it's the Holy Spirit with or working through Christ's humanity. His charity, which is the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit infuses his charity in his will, and collaborating with the Holy Spirit, he also uh, attains freedom for us. Okay, that's that's all I have to say. Thank what you. are the modes of divine presence? Would you like to go over those quickly, and then we'll, we'll have a break? Yeah. So Sister Magdalen referred to them. Um, so there are three. They are modes of divine presence because God is present in everything that exists. Uh, in some things, he is present in only one way. That's the first mode of divine presence because he is their cause. The cause is present in its effect. Um, and so there's a likeness of the cause in its effect. And 
I refer to this very quickly as being God's knowledge, God knows everything, and God's uh, power, his, his uh, omnipotence works through all things. So that's the first mode of divine presence. In some things, there's a special uh, presence, a special mode of, in, of, of presence. We call it indwelling or inhabitation. Um, and that is through grace. And that only occurs in angels and human beings who have grace. And uh, the invisible missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit um, correspond to this second mode of divine presence. And the third mode of divine presence, Christ. Uh, that's Christ's humanity. God is present in Christ's humanity in a unique way. And this is and somewhat this is prolonged. This is also found in the Eucharist. But um, here, this is Christ's visible mission, not the invisible mission, though the invisible missions are involved. Uh, that's the unique case. And the, Christ's unique mode of divine presence works to causes uh, is involved in the causing and the uh, giving of the second mode of divine presence. So we saw that in his passion. He's actually uh, working our uh, salvation, and that means he's working, he's contributing, or yeah, he's working for us to receive the, the indwelling of the Trinity. Okay. His sacrifice away our soul grows in friendship with God. Sacrifice, it, a sacrifice is um, an expression of love. So it's the exterior, or um, we involve uh, something exterior. Our love, charity is, is in our soul, in our will. And so when we do something um, physically or um, when we suffer something, we endure something, when we give something, we are expressing love. And that sacrifice um, grows our friendship with God. Uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross um, obtained friendship with God for us because we were enemies of God, as St. Paul teaches in his letter to the Romans. And so when we do something out of charity, uh, our sacrifice is actually also is prolonging is based on Christ char uh, Christ charity and Christ sacrifice. So we could say that there's only one true sacrifice, and that it everything participates in that sacrifice. Uh, we extend uh, that sacrifice when we do things out of love. But a sacrifice where there is no charity uh, does not grow our friendship with God. Great. Thank you very much, Father John.